Hey folks, Steve here with another Fall of the Third Reich video. We're going to continue uh, our play through of turn one in this video. Hopefully I'll pick up the pace here a little bit. I um, want to make sure we're, we're slowly working our way through the game um, just because there are uh, concepts and rules that I'm still adjusting to. But as we get past this video and we get into turns two, three, four, five, uh, etc., I expect I should be able to get through it much more quickly and not record every single die roll and we'll just sort of get through uh, the game a little more quickly and, and not have you guys see every single you know counter move that I do. But I want to make sure at least early on you kind of see the game mechanics as we go and I have a chance to kind of talk through things. So hoping to get one turn to a video in the future after this one at least and we'll try to get through it. Uh, last video we had done all the sort of beginning stuff Axis had allocated its OKW and OKH uh, markers. The Axis action phase uh, occurred, um, and that involved their operational movement and combat. Uh, we had to attack around Kursk. That didn't go well as the Germans, of course. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot else that I wanted to do, just because it was like, you know, what, what could we, what could we even do? Um, that's going to keep the, the game going for us uh, as the Germans that isn't going to sabotage ourselves, right? Like, why attack on the East Front? It's just going to hurt us. Well, I was looking, um, and I guess online, you know, at reading some of the discussion on Board Game Geek, like, there is some reason to try to make a push for Kursk, um, but you probably want to attack a little bit differently than the, the mandated one, and what I probably could have done or should have done was focused more on attacking additional places near Kursk that would have enabled us to maybe capture it or do a better job. Um, but I stuck with just attacking uh, where we had to, and I didn't attack anywhere else, so I don't know. If I was playing the more open game and I wasn't playing, um, you know, uh, you know, we weren't you know, weren't playing uh, the historical thing, we were just playing any which way, and I could not attack Kursk or, atta or attack Kursk differently, you know, m maybe things would be different. I'm just not really sure what mistakes I'm going to have made um, as we get going here. I do know that uh, a lot of folks are questioning, like, are the Soviets too strong on the East Front, and it can get to a point where, like, the Germans totally collapse. I don't know if that's going to occur here. Um, as we take actions this video as the Soviets, I will be trying to figure out well, how exactly would we even try to do that uh, and do it quickly, and I think a lot of that is going to come down to uh, can we eliminate German steps faster than they can be replaced and, you know, replaced via replacement points and then replaced via uh, reinforcements that will come on to uh, the board uh, as we go. So, certainly going to be trying to look through that. Um... Also, looking more generally uh, for the Western Allies, I mean, right now, the uh, the U.S. landed um, in Gala, and they took it, but uh, the Commonwealth failed <laughs> to land in Syracuse, and so we may see a delay uh, down here on, you know, how are we going to expand our, our movement out. And I was thinking through, like, what what else could we be doing to slow down the Allies? And I wasn't sure if, like, does it make sense to pull these guys back to Messina? Or at least make the Allies fight them down here, and maybe we can retreat back, and I can get more units, you know, moved down here, and maybe we don't need to put units on the line over here until later. I'm just not sure. There's, there's a lot about the game where it's like... I. Having not seen enough of the game, I don't know what are all the good moves. But I, I think the Axis definitely has to capitalize on the fact that the Commonwealth failed down here, and we may be able to delay the fall of Sicily and thus the fall of Italy. Now the thing is, the Allies could conceivably, you know, if we can't make something happen in Sicily, you know, we've already taken one town. We could potentially try to land somewhere else, um, so if, you know, Rome is undefended or less defended, maybe we try to make a landing over here and then work our way over here. Maybe we, you know, land uh, up here in Genoa and then have a way to get to Milan further north. It, you know, we now that we've gotten past the first turn, the sort of historical requirements aren't 
aren't latching us down, we could try to get somewhere else. Um, I mean, historically, the landings at Syracuse, I think, were successful, and then the Allies sort of pushed their way up through taking the rest of Sicily. We might not be so lucky here because of that failed invasion. So, you know, we're already sort of having to pivot and figure out what to do. Um, now, I will say, uh, as, we're, as we're looking at things, um, I had made Gala a... Uh, I had called it a mountain hex, but supposedly it's a rough hex, or at least that's what somebody said on Board Game Geek, but I don't think they were answering in, a, in a, an official capacity. So I don't know what to tell you about Gala. Again, it, unclear, mountain or rough. Um, it might have made a difference if I looked at the invasion modifiers. Um, oh, actually, mountain and rough are the same for purposes of invasion ship, so it wouldn't have mattered. Um, but somebody was questioning why Syracuse is a swamp hex uh, in the comments of the last video, um, and that, you know, they, it, it, they didn't believe there was, like, that region is not swampy. Well, as best as I can tell, you know, I just went and Googled, you know, Syracuse, Sicily, swamp, and there are marshlands around here, but I don't know that, like, I just don't know enough, and I, and I didn't research too heavily, like, it looks like they're saying, like, this hex, this hex, and this hex. Our, our, our marsh or swamp, you know, the game terrain is swamp, but if it was a marsh, you would say it, it's swamp, right? They basically treated the same in terms of terrain, um, in a lot of war games anyway. So, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, the fact that Syracuse is set up as a swamp, I don't know how bad or, or correct that is, like, good or bad. I, I don't know enough. I've never been to Syracuse. Um, I've been to Italy, but not, not Sicily and not Syracuse, so... Um, I, I can't tell you for certain, but um, based on the color of the hex, I can say that it, it does appear to be swamp for the game terrain, and that's as best as I can I can manage it. Um, and really, you know, I complained in the last video, everywhere else on the map, the terrain is pretty clear, like mountain is different than rough, I can kind of see and tell the differences, but for some reason just down here it was harder uh, for Sicily, I don't, I don't know. Um, so still probably going to be one of my critiques of the game is the map direction in terms of art and, and color choices, but um, you know I'm not going to lose my mind over it. Um, okay, so let's just get into the action now. So we have the Allied Soviet uh, reaction phase. So the purpose of the reaction phase is to allow, uh, after the, ac the Axis does their sort of like full movement and attack based on where they put their command structure, via the, the markers. Um, the Allies and the Soviets um, have an opportunity to do some very light response. And by light, I really do mean light. So what, what effect does that take? Well, um, the, uh, the side that is not going right now get a certain number of uh, reaction markers. Um, the Allies and Soviets each get one reaction marker. The Allied marker may be used in any theater, but the East, the East, or the Soviet marker has to be used in the East or Balkan theaters, and then the Germans get get some of those. Um, and so, um, hmm, hmm. the funny thing is with these reaction markers, like they, and I don't know if this is intentional or not. I have to see why it's this way. It says they each get a reaction marker, but I'm counting three. So you can see it says reaction and movement combat. Reaction and movement combat. I don't know if it's like you... I'm just not... <laughs> just, I'm not sure how this is supposed to be played. Um, I'm trying to look around the map if there are any other markers that I've missed um, that I should use for this purpose. I don't see them. So I have to imagine, I guess what's important is that I can use these markers to mark, you know, however many units I might need to mark, but, but really the main marker is going to go in one place, I guess. Um, it is odd that I get, I have more than one, I will say that, but I, I'm not going to worry too much about it. So what do you, what do, you do with reaction? Well, you take the uh, the counter, the marker, and you kind of have two different ways to do it. You can um, pull units together, or you can disperse them. Um, so if you selected a hex that had multiple units in it, those 
units in the specific hex that you designated can all go do movement uh, and then can potentially do combat. Um, or you put that marker in a space, and maybe that space can already have units, but, but what you're going to do is you're going to move units that are not in that hex to that hex. You're going to collect them into that hex. You still have to um, respect the stacking limit, but you can pull units together. So how would you use this? Well, I, the Germans, I feel like, and the uh, Soviets are going to have a lot more bandwidth to be doing this right now because they have a lot more space to work with. But if you're on the strategic defensive, you're probably going to use those markers either to, again, pull units together or disperse them to cover a line or a break in the line or a gap or to protect a critical area or move units maybe that were stationed somewhere uh, where they'll be more useful for, for, for follow-on activities. If you're on the strategic offensive, um, what you're probably going to be trying to use those guys to do is to... Uh, sort of exploit uh, an opponent's gap in the line after maybe they did an attack and they lost a bunch of units and they left some hexes empty. You can use those reaction markers to sort of capitalize on that failure. Or, you know, if, if the opponent has tried to do a spoiling attack and hurt you, you can likewise sort of put units back in the middle of the line to kind of help uh, for your next combat phase. Now there is... Um, a distinct exploitation phase that occurs um, after all of this. Um, an exploitation phase movement and all of that is really based around, I think, mechanized units. We'll have to look at that. Um, but that is distinct from reaction. So reaction and exploitation, technically different, but m in a meaningful way, you might, as the Soviets, for instance, use your reaction marker to do exploitation type of stuff depending on the game circumstances. So it's flexible, but again, you really just get uh, one reaction marker to use in this phase. So you really have to pick where it's going to be. You can't do a lot of it. Um, you're only going to do it in a specific place. So um, starting with the Western Allies, right, we don't have anything in France where that would maybe be an obvious place to try something. Um, and in Sicily, you know, what can we do? Well, our units are already, you know... Um, our units are already kind of in place where they are. I, I can't do much more. So the question would be like, oh, I'm going to do uh, reaction movement right in combat. That would enable these units in Gala to move out, right? Now the problem is they start their activity um, in the zone of control of these German uh, mechanized units. And so there's really, like, they can't really go anywhere anyway. Um, they're kind of stuck in Gala. Um, they're off the beach, but they're, they're not pushed very far in. But what we can do is we can put the marker on that and say, yeah, they're, they're reacting, um, and they can perform combat. Now, their combat capability, if we decide to do this, is just going to be, like, let's see, we... Our flipped unit with zero attack factors, we have a unit with five, and our airborne, so we would have seven versus uh, three and a B, and a B could end up being between three and six. So it could be six, um, it could be nine. So seven and nine. I, I think those would all be pretty bad rolls, all things considered. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot that we could do to influence this table anymore uh, that would really help. Um, yeah, there's not a whole lot of die roll modifiers in this game that would like change your combat results, so it's just like, okay, is there a fort? Are we using paratroopers if launched as an air attack? Is there car carpet bombing, which um, at the moment there's no, car no carpet bombing? Um, and the only other things would be terrain effects and you know, these units are in mountain, and so, uh, let's see, combat mountain would be two additional defense factors. Um, I, I don't think we have the strength to actually do anything here. We just don't have enough power um, to hit that those units, at least not right now. So I, I think for the allies, we just say we're, we're not going to do any reaction movement. We're just going to 
you know, we pass, right? We, we don't have enough guys on the continent. Um, our Americans don't have enough firepower to have a very good chance of hurting the Germans in a way that isn't going to cost them further progress, right? Because what's going to happen is um, it's very likely uh, they're going to be rolling on the one to two, and what, what are we going to get? We're likely going to get, like, attacker eliminated, no advance kind of thing. Like, very, very likely we're going to lose a lot of our oomph down here, and there's not really very many Americans in the Mediterranean box anyway, so we... Bad, bad idea, right? I, I think we'll just say that's a bad idea. Now, for the Soviets, maybe a different story. Um, we can decide to, again, we could collect some units and force um, something to occur. Uh, so what types of things could we do? Well, we've got a bunch of these reserves back here. So we could, for instance, say, um, like, okay, let's, let's go you know, here, and let's see, that unit could move over here, and, you know, maybe this unit could move over here, and then we would have 14, 19 attacking four, and have really good odds, and probably knock these guys out, and advance after combat, and cause all kinds of problems. So I think... I mean, I think maybe that's what we do, right? I mean, I, that, to me, seems like a decent decent option. I, maybe that's what's what, what we do, right? Because we, we, we can only do this either dispersing or moving units. So if I said, yeah, we're going to go here, right? We're going to move this guy, one, two, three, four movement, he's fine. Cup, like, three movement, he's fine. These guys are all here. The unit that was already there was already there. And we can do reaction combat. And again, 19 combat factors against 4. Now, it's not quite enough um, to get 5 to 1 odds. But 4 to 1 odds in this game is pretty good. Uh, and if I look at the terrain, it's just clear terrain. Um, right? Nothing nothing too crazy there. Um, and I don't think there's any other uh, variables here. I think it's a straight up 4 to 1 die roll, which is pretty good, I think, or should be pretty good. So roll die. I rolled a 3, which is an EX with an advance. So EX, all defending steps eliminated, attacker loses equal number of steps, advance if possible. Okay. So, this step is lost, so we eliminate more German armor units. We need to take a step loss. Um, we really only have mechanized or armor, so we'll lose this mechanized unit, which is a single step, and then we can advance, and I think what we'll do, let's see, should I advance? Well, let's do that. So there, we, we are now threatening that. Um, the real question is, like, does it make any sense at all to do this? We leave a gap here for infantry, but it's not like they can really do anything. And then it's like we can maybe do a big nasty combined attack but I don't know I'm not sure I'm not sure the, the way this game is gonna really work um, what we don't want to see is some kind of spoiling attack where these guys knock out this unit and cause goofy supply problems so we'll we'll for now we'll be easy going and just move these guys like so um, and when the Soviets have their normal, uh, you know, turn, we'll probably see a lot of this get real kooky crazy. Um, but yeah, so I think that's it for the Allied uh, and Soviet uh, reaction segment. And when we do this, the Allies would do all their movement and then all their combat before the Soviets do all their movement and combat. Um, at least that's the way it reads to me. Not a big deal. Um,
Okay, so now uh, we have axis attrition. So if we had actually done something to knock these guys all out of supply, um, then uh, they would be probably taking attrition, but um, the axis needs to just check for supply, and after checking for supply, all out of supply units are eliminated, um, unless they're in a supply fort. Uh, I believe everyone is fine for supply. Not enough of the game has changed where we have units that are out of supply, and you know these units over here, like, oh, I can count to here, which is a controlled city, and then that can trace all the way back to Germany, basically, is all we need to worry about. Um, okay, so now we have the exploitation movement phase for the Axis. I'm, I'm not sure there's going to be much for them to do here, so I'm going to pause, I'm going to double check the rules on exploitation, and then we'll take care of that. Okay, so for exploitation movement, and it is just movement, no, no combat is to occur. Basically, if they're mechanized uh, units, they can... Um, any mechanized units only, subject to all standard movement rules, except that supplied mechanized units may ignore enemy non-mechanized zots for movement uh, purposes only. Um, and they have to start, if, you're, if we're doing Germans and Soviets, which we're doing the Germans right now, um, uh, German Soviet mechanized units must start in command range uh, of one of their markers um, to do that. So, uh, and there's a few other little tidbits to that, but not a whole lot. Um, okay, so what could we do? Well, um, hmm, hmm, hmm. it's interesting trying to think through what we might want to do. <laughs> um, So if we look over to the west, anyway, in, in, in terms of the front line, like we could move some units around a little bit. We could send somebody up here. Now that looks like Messina's in clear terrain. The town would maybe help us a little bit in actual combat. Um, town gives one defensive factor, but a mountain gives two. Um... So it's like, okay, do we try to use these mechanized units and pull back to Messina? It can't be directly invaded. Um, so I would say no. And we put our other OKW here in Palermo. And we've not needed it. Um, and I would even say, you know, we, we didn't really need to put it there at all. Um, I, I think we stay as is here. We just hold the line like so for the moment. So I, I don't think there's any reason to do exploitation movement that way. Um, now on the east front, I think that could be a whole different, uh, whole other different thing. Um, oh, and I guess what, while we're over here, is there anything we want to do uh, over here? Uh, we could strengthen ourselves that way. Um, I'm not sure there's a whole lot that we really care about doing. Could you try moving this guy down this way to kind of defend over here. Be one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. So yeah, we could do that. Um, just to kind of help get more units into the beaches, I guess, as quickly as we can. Um, but over on the east side, you know, what, what can we try to do? Um, well, we, we can ignore... See, we could pull some units back... Like so. And that would help...
block the line a little bit. But say, so is that enough? Will that will that do anything to help us? Um, maybe. I think we do that, right? We can't move this unit because he's an infantry over here. Um, but I moved some. I shuffled them sort of out. They could ignore the zocks of these uh, Soviet infantry and could swing out this way. Um, and still being within range, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, they could still get out of there. Um, pretty sure I'm allowed to do that. So, so that exploitation movement, not even, at, you know, if we think about the term exploitation in terms of World War II games, you're probably thinking break the line, exploit into the backfield of the enemy. Here, we're sort of exploiting backwards. We're using mechanized retreat to sort of try to reestablish our line within reason, um, knowing that we really don't have that many options. Um, but, yeah, I, th I think that's all we want to do. I could try to do some goofiness, like try to like come back off the line with certain units, but I I don't know. I it, you know a lot of these units on the front lines, the Germans are infantry too. I can't just pull them back. So limited capability, um, but that may have to do just so that we you know we were about to have a really nasty combat with like you know a whole bunch of units being able to focus fire on that and. That probably would have gone badly. I don't know. I would have to figure out the odds, but um, I think it makes sense to straighten the line out and lessen the opportunity for the Soviets to break the line and, and sort of surge out of here and really screw up Army Group South. That's my thinking. Um, okay, so that was the uh, exploitation movement. Uh, and now we have a cleanup phase, and I'm not sure what the cleanup phase is supposed to be. Um, I'm trying to look at what the cleanup phase actually does. Um, I might need a second might need a second to look this up. Because it's not a section in the rules that I can see. Um, cleanup phase. Uh, Alright, hold on. Okay, so I just looked up the cleanup. Um, what's weird is I, like, there's not a section of the rules that tells you what it does. You have to kind of find, I, I ended up finding the PDF and did a search on the word clean and it would come up. So basically, and I screwed up for, I, I, it was, I'm blind. Here's the allied reaction marker, uh, shafe. Uh, and then uh, there is a Stavka reaction marker up there. So I guess you have these extra chits to show which units moved, I'm guessing. Um, these sort of, you know, these these markers are used to denote which units may be moved if you need them, I'm guessing is their purpose. I'm not 100% sure of that, but that seems to be the way it goes. So the cleanup is just, you, you remove those markers if you had placed them, and then it looks like our OKW markers actually go back to uh, the OKW, OKH, um, boxes. So, uh, I guess they, they must not have an impact on uh, the Allied and Soviet activities, right? Because it's like you remove them on the next cleanup phase, this was a cleanup phase, uh, and that's it. Um, okay, so uh, we can safely call that the, like, the axis half of the turn is over. And we get to the actual Allied side. So what do, what do we have coming next? We have Allied Soviet Action Phase. So we have the Allied Operational Movement Segment, where they're going to place their SHAEF marker. Um, that is what governs how supply flows out from controlled Allied areas. The Allies, if, as a reminder, don't have OKW or Stavka-like chits. They, you know, all units are basically in command for them. But supply is sort of calculated almost like an inverse. So Axis and Soviets get supply if you can trace back to a city or a town, and then that city or town can trace back to an ultimate supply source. The Allies are always in command, but they have to trace back to these uh, SHAEF, SHAFE markers, 
uh, that push supply out from controlled ports. And so um, what you're really more worried about is where are my chafe markers and do I, am I projecting enough supply for my units to do the stuff that we want. So what we would do is have uh, the uh, chafe placement, then movement, then the Soviets would do their Stavka placement and movement, and then we would have, so all movement is done, and then you have combat. So allied combat, if we had air units set for carpet bombing, that would happen, and then we do our combats, and then the Soviets do their combats. This is a little bit different than if you see the reaction where the movement and combat of the Allies is done all first. Here, in the normal operational, all the movement is done across the two different Allied sides, Allied and Soviet, and then the Allied combat, and then the Soviet combat. Probably doesn't make a huge difference for me playing solo. It might matter in a multiplayer game or where the Allies want to outperform the Soviets in that case. Um, I might even break the rules a little bit because this is a solitaire game and just do all the Allied combat knowing that, you know, unless we're in the Balkans, it probably isn't going to affect one another either way. Um, and then it, you can see sort of the rest of the turn. It's going to be an Axis reaction, so very similar to uh, the Allied and Soviet reaction. Uh, then there's going to be attrition, which probably won't be terribly relevant, and then we'll have some exploitation as well. And then the last thing we do before the end of the turn is uh, we have some strategic movement, a victory check, and then one last cleanup uh, for any of our markers that were placed. So this should be pretty straightforward. So um, I'm going to put a pause here, and I'm going to think through where we want to put these markers and how we want to do our movement. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the Allied stuff. So the Shafe markers, which much like all the other counters of this type, come in one, two, three, four value markers, um, can be placed during the invasion step and this step. So technically, when we started the game and we did our invasions here, we actually could have selected uh, to put a marker on one of the uh, beachheads with the beachheads. Uh, we did not do that, mostly because I didn't know we could, but it didn't really matter because I think, depending on how your invasions go, being able to place the shape markers now helps because you get to pick where it makes sense to go. So, um, much like the German and Soviet markers have a multiplier based on if you're going to place them in a town or a city, uh, the shape markers are going to project supply based on where you place them as well. If they're placed on a beachhead marker, Whatever the number is on the counter that you place there is times two. Uh, if it's just a port town, it's times one. And if it's a port city, then it's back to a times two. Um, and then there are specialty port cities that are much better, like Antwerp, which has a times five multiplier. Um, so here's the thing. In terms of supply, the beachhead marker by itself so provides supply to units that are... Uh, in the beachhead marker hex space itself, as well as the adjacent space, basically. Um, yeah, uh, they are in supply in or adjacent to uh, a beach marker. So we are in Gala adjacent to the beachhead marker. So this stack of Americans are technically in supply. Um, but if they were to say we did attack here and we forced them to retreat and we moved here, we would actually be out of supply or we would be you know, adjudicated to be out of supply until our shafe marker goes down and our sort of supply bubble expands. Now, um, this becomes more tricky when we have multiple areas under allied control because you really only have four shafe markers. You have to sort of figure out what is the most efficient use of the markers based on what I control to provide enough supply being pushed out to reach where I want to go next. That, that's sort of like a leapfrog thought process. So you will eventually move the shave markers from ports that you control further up the way to wherever you're trying to go. Now, for the Western Allies right now, this is all very easy. We are stuck at the very you know, rock bottom, basically, of Sicily, um, trying to get further up uh, into Italy, so we don't we don't really have a lot of options. But let's make it easy for ourselves and just say, well, let's use let's say we have the four 
the four uh, marker. That's the best one, um, but it's not like we, we have a lot of other areas to pick from at the moment. So uh, we control a port town. So if we would put this here, um, a port town is just worth times one. So one times four is four. We could count, you know, one, two, three, four. We get up to Messina and still be in supply, right? Not a big deal. Um, but if we decide to put it on the beachhead marker, uh, as it happens, we could choose that. Well, that's times two, so it becomes eight, which then goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we get further up. Now, uh, Contenzaro is not a port city, so we, you know, we wouldn't leapfrog all the way up there, but we could. That would give us enough supply to operate out of Sicily if we managed to take Syracuse, if we managed to take Messina. Uh, Messina's probably the better one. Then we could start looking at, okay, now we can get supply, uh, you know, further up the way. Um, again, if we put the, the four here on Syracuse later, we would go one, two, uh, three, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, we get much further uh, afield. We'll probably need to make some additional landings in Italy just to keep the drive going. Um, but, you know, we certainly have a much, a much better uh, bandwidth to operate in. You can see if we can get up to Naples up here, that's a times four. If we put the four here, four times four uh, is 16. So then you're looking at, and I covered this in a previous video, well, 16 hexes from Naples. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. I mean, that gets you basically the rest of Italy is going to be in supply, and you really don't have much concern for supply. Um, and once you clear Italy, then you can look at, okay, well, then, you know, we move our forces out of here. We start focusing on France. Well, we can move the shape marker up here, and then it's not as big a deal. We get to Marseille. That's uh, also a high uh, multiplier. So I think for the moment, the easiest thing we could do, to me it makes the most sense to do this, um, we could put the four marker here on the beachhead and get eight from here, and that gets us quite a bit of, of the, the area. And then, you know, if we do another landing somewhere else, we could use the three marker, and then, let's like, say we landed here or over here, be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, would be enough to get us to Naples. So, um, technically an easy choice right now, but I just wanted to explain my thought process on how do we make this work. And it's going to get tougher once we start getting into France. We have to decide um, how we're going to get onto the continent and stay supplied, and how quickly can we get to Antwerp uh, and get that major port to basically be able to operate into the rest of Europe from that point. So, weird stuff, trying to figure that all out, kind of an odd... It's the oddity of the game system. It is unlike other game systems where we have to think about that. But that seems to be... The, the main thing to try to, to, try to do. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Now we now that we've done that, do we want to do any movement? Um, okay, movement by sea. Units can enter a port beachhead as newly arrived reinforcements, as replacements, or during the transit segment, or for an invasion beachhead by invasion. Uh, okay, so here's the troubling thing. We can't actually get units down here out of the Mediterranean box. One, because the Commonwealth can't even get down here, and even if we had other U.S. units, they couldn't even arrive uh, unless we get to the transit segment. So, um, we, we, re we really don't have any options here. We're, we're setting up the supply interface, but that's it. So that's that's all the allies can do. Their allied movement step is over. There's not much to do at all. And in terms of combat, again, we didn't combat before. I don't think we're going to combat now as the Western allies. The, the invasions went so poorly, we just don't have um, a lot of bandwidth. 
to operate with. That's it. I mean, that, that's all we can do. We just don't have much. Um, not a great start. Now, for the Soviets, a little bit different. Now, the Soviet player has their Stavka markers. They number one to four. They're used identically to the Germans, so we're going to plug them in a town or a city. Um, and, yeah, so that, you know, there's definitely a lot more um, bandwidth here as the Soviet, so I'm just going to drag the whole camera over here and let's talk through what we want to do. Um, now we have forces down here that would be good to try to disrupt, but um, I don't think we have enough... I'm not sure we have enough oomph to actually make something happen down here. We might need to wait for some reinforcements. Um, we could do some stuff down here. Uh, troubling thing is we do have Zoc issues the whole way up the line. We're not really going to be able to slide past a lot of guys. That's, that's sort of the reality um, that we have. Uh, let's see. The other thing I need to worry about is how rivers are affected by Zox. Um, Zox do not extend across major river hex sides. And a major river looks like... Okay, it's a thicker blue lines. So I need to watch that. So and it's going to be I think this is going to be another one of those like man, I wish the game was a little bit better about differentiating terrain. So Zox don't extend across major rivers. So here is obviously a major river. Um, it looks like this is not a major river. And uh, I don't know. Some of this is really tricky. Like, it's dark enough over here that it looks like a major river, but when I look over here, it actually looks like it's not a major river. So somewhere, there's some there's some hex side where it stops being a major river, and it's a minor river, or a regular river, rather. Um, and I don't know that I can tell where that change occurs. So I really, I'm kind of annoyed by that. That annoys me a lot. Um, it, it, there's different ways games tend to handle this. Um, and sometimes what they'll do is they'll make the major river like a dotted line in between the river side, so you can tell it's like, oh, it's much bigger, thicker. This game doesn't have that, so you're really just looking like, is it dark blue? And is it slightly thinner, lighter blue? But I'm not sure that the logic is applied in all the same places to the same degree where it's like, oh, that's very obviously a major river, or that's very obviously a minor river. Um, that is really annoying. That's, oh, that's going to make me frustrated as we do this. Um, oh, that's so frustrating. I was hoping it wouldn't be so bad, but it is... There are some places on the map where it is really not clear. So, that's a bummer. <laughs> um, so I'm going to treat this river here as a regular river, so the Zox do apply. Um, so it's really more about, like, where do we want to attack, and how far do we think we're going to go. Um, I definitely think it makes sense to attack in a lot of different places along the line here. Um, I, I think we try, let's see, I like the idea of beating up on the German, um, I like beating up on the German armor to just negate them as much as possible. A lot of this area seems like it's going to be tough to crack just because of the terrain. Um, I 
I mean, the easiest thing would be I'm going to plop this in the city. Oh, no. Kursk is a town. Well, if I put the four here, that gives everybody around here good capability. Um, and I kind of see the challenge with operating where there's not a town or a city. Like, down here, there's really not... There's just not a lot. So it's like, oh, if I place this unit in this area, like, where's the closest town or city down here in the south? Like, I have to take one of these areas before I can even think to push further ahead, right? So that much seems like a big challenge. Kursk is super important right now because it is in the center of my line, and I'm just looking, I'm like, okay, there's no other major towns that I have. And this is almost like one of those interesting things, like if somehow the Axis could push back the Soviets, it's like they've got nowhere to go. If they lose Kursk, like I don't even know how they activate units to attack. Like they don't have anywhere that they can even do that in, it seems like. Like you have to really push down this way. If you can't push this way, you have to push this way to get a rel. That's what it seems like. So it is interesting, like, actually trying to play through and understanding, like, I can't even make gains down here until I make some changes. Like, where else can I go? Um, so anyway, sorry for that. <laughs> so let's put a marker here in Moscow. So Stavka there, it gives me six range. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. Some overlap, but I think that'll help us figure out where we're gonna go. As I look over here, there's again not, I know there's not many cities up here, towns or cities for the area. There's just not a lot, period. So we're gonna be stuck operating out of Leningrad, basically. Um, so, maybe I put one up here and left. Okay, my camera screwed up a little bit, but it's just as well. I figured out a better setup for our Stavka markers as the Soviets, and I'll show you um, as much as I can the selection here. So we have Stavka 2. It's actually the one marker flipped to the city for Leningrad. That gives us some operational capability in the very, very far north in case we can knock some of the Germans back off of Leningrad. Then I have uh, our three marker uh, on the town side in that space there on the sort of the left half of the screen. That enables us to kind of get some activations down here. Then we have our two marker in Moscow that flips to the four range. And my camera's being all kinds of stupid. I put the four marker in Kursk itself. That gives us four hexes of range for basically the Kursk counterattacks. And everywhere else from there is going to not be able to attack. That's okay. I think it's going to be, if we make ground here, that will start to open up um, things a little bit so that we can push through and kind of swing down. And then we'll be able to have some command range down here. Um, we'll also be able to work our way out that way. So I, I think that works. It, it is just very interesting to see that the Soviets don't control you know, anything down here to where um, uh, to where you can actually attack. Um, you need those markers to actually attack. Um, so yeah, but now we can do our Soviet movement, which I'm going to do off camera, but every unit can move. So it doesn't matter if they're in range of a Stavka or not, so it's all about getting some of these backup units just just adding combat factors where we think we're going to be able to make some useful attacks and then we'll figure out how we're going to operate that. Okay, so you can see uh, the movements here. Uh, most, it, you know, it really just involved moving units closer to the front where I'm planning on attacking. As I'm thinking through the attacks, I do want to point something out in terms of, um, uh, you know, what we're even trying to achieve. <laughs> So, uh, here's the replacement number of steps per turn. 
Germans will get 2 uh, times 4, because they have 4 factory hexes, so 8 per turn. Uh, the Soviets are going to get 10, which is 2 more, and that doesn't really change um, in 1943. They can't lose any. And then the Germans are going to get a bunch of re, uh, reinforcements from the turn track. So the, the Axis, even though you might think, oh, the, the Axis is on the back foot as part of the war now, 43 onward, they still have men and material to use. So the question is going to be, like, wh what are we going to do in these attacks? You know, one, we, we want to hurt the Germans a lot, as much as we can. Um, obviously, a, a good, good goal, right, to try to achieve. Um, if we can, I, I don't know that we're going to eliminate eight steps. We have a greater reinforcement rate, so even if we take equal losses from the Germans to the Soviets, the Soviets are kind of still going to come out ahead on that, um, especially once the Allies actually get onto the continent. It's going to be a lot harder for the Germans to, to deal with that, right? I mean, right now we're saying it's 10 to 8. Ignoring the Western Allies are even involved, you know, um, so the crunch is definitely going to be there. Um, so we need to be eliminating the Germans a lot and then pushing them back, taking the command infrastructure so we can maintain our momentum as the USSR. That's the real key thing here. So I think what we're going to do, um, and, and I'm going to save us some time because I know this video is going to get long. Um, I'm going to do the attacks. And again, I, the way that this is set up, I can choose which attacks I'm going to conduct as I make them, so if I make one attack nearby and it sucked real bad, I can just choose not to attack in that area, I can move on to another attack and just attack until everyone's, everyone that could attack has an attack to my satisfaction and then we end that and then we'll move on to um, the Axis reaction phase. So I'll tell you right now where we're going to focus our attacks are going to be, um, obviously, uh, this area, right, operating off the stock marker. We're going to be um, attacking uh, over here, around projecting for this stock marker, as well as over here, and then possibly up here. I'm going to have to see what the numbers look like. And keep in mind, um, a lot of those attacks are going to be from one hex to another hex. And only in a couple of spaces, like around here, um, are we actually able to do stuff like multiple hexes attacking one hex? Because they're surrounded on like four sides, and units don't have any other units, or Soviet units don't have any access units in their Zoc. So over here, we're going to get two hexes on one down over here. So we should see some stuff start to break up. Um, as we do that, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how many breaks in the line we create. Because when it's the Axis turn for the reaction, they only get the one reaction marker, so they really are going to have to figure out, you know, what are they going to respond to if they can only respond to one or more things. That's probably going to be the way this shakes out. So really wanting to hurt the Germans so much that their only option is to try to retreat on their own turn, that the reaction phase movement won't be enough to save them. That That's the hope. That's the idea. So I'm going to take myself off camera. I'm going to do the attacks, like I said, up here, over here, down here, and around this area. And when we come back, I'll show the aftermath of those combats. There's not a whole lot to think through here. I will say that the Luftwaffe um, has already been used a combat phase this turn. So when, we roll, when I go to roll the ABC strength values of the Germans, I do not believe they get a plus one. Um, for their rating from the Luftwaffe, because we already used that for um, our operational phase as the Axis. Uh, that's the way it read to me, which means it will be harder for the Germans to make headway here. Um, but yeah, we will show we will show the aftermath here uh, in just a second. Okay, here are things after the Axis. I'm sorry, the Soviet combat. Um, so you can see we've smashed through. We've actually taken. Um, what is that? Uh, Kharkov, which is a victory point uh, city, um, which is going to help us a lot with it being a city. We can actually extend um, our offensive now down further south, so we can entertain ideas of uh, pushing towards the Dnepropetrovsk down here with these units as well. Uh, so very good uh, progress there. We did force some units back away from Kursk over here. 
um, generally pushing back uh, the, the Germans. Um, I contemplated doing a two-to-one attack here, but I don't think I need to. Um, I, I think we, we have enough pressure that we can simply um, make use of other, uh, other bits of the situation as we go. Um, we did force some units back uh, around Arel, and in fact, the way that you count supply in this game, um, at least it seems to me like this was the thing to try to do, is I, I forced some units back here and here. There were some Axis units that were left behind, um, and because I sort of have Zox projected across Arel, uh, those units on subsequent attacks were out of supply, and C units or any lettered units use the lowest combat value if out of supply, which enabled me, with my Soviet units, to force retreats, uh, so they didn't take any losses. Well, I'll, I'll say this much. I'm choosing to interpret the combat results table a certain way. So here there's um, a DEX, Defender Exchange. Defender eliminates all steps but one. Surviving, Defending Step suffers a DR, which is a, a retreat. And then the attacker loses steps equal to the eliminated defending steps, advance possible. The way I interpreted that is, if I had more than one step, we would lose down to one step as the axis, and then however many steps were lost then are lost from the Soviet side, and then your your um, you know you would, those that last remaining unit suffers a DR. Well, it couldn't retreat into the zone of control of my mechanized Soviet units, and so they are eliminated. I took that to mean that because that one step was eliminated from a retreat, not from the actual combat result, the Soviets didn't actually lose any steps in that combat. That to me makes sense, that's how I'm interpreting the rules based on how it's stated. Um, if someone's watching and thinks differently, let me know, and maybe we can ask on BoardGameGeek, but that's the way I always and, you know, have read those types of things. So while we haven't taken Orel, which is a city, um, we're going to. <laughs> in a second, or very likely we're going to. Um, so uh, it's as good as taken. I don't think the Germans can even react into it. So we've, we've sort of pushed these guys back out. Um, we did cause some losses over here. Not all of them allowed us to advance. So we really wanted to catch the, this German armor here out of supply like we did uh, further south. But I couldn't quite do it. I, I didn't get the advance. And so while we're poking our head, through here, um, this unit can still trace supply via uh, the town of Bryansk, I believe. I'll have to do a double check on the count, but the Axis will have a chance to respond before they have attrition. Um, but the main thing is, like, we are pushing the Germans back, and we did, up here, eliminate some German units, but we lost some units in Leningrad ourselves, so we, we really couldn't safely advance. Um, but we, we're basically going to cause the Germans to be worn thin down there. So I'd say this was a pretty good combat. We managed to do a lot of combats in a lot of places. Um, and the Germans going to have to decide, the German side of my brain is going to have to decide, where are we going to respond? We can only respond minimally. What can we do to actually respond? Um, and, and it's going to be tough. We, we need to maximize our ZOC coverage. We need to try to do something to slow down the Soviets, but I think the Soviets had a pretty good die roll. I mean, we didn't get as far as we wanted to in some areas, but I think generally the, the Soviets did well with their die rolls for, for combat. So that's over, and we're going to go to that Axis reaction phase. So the OKW reaction segment can occur here. So do we want to do anything with uh, the Soviet, or I'm sorry, the German... Uh, movement in the West. Um, uh, I don't really see what the value would be, to be honest. Um, I just don't see where we would make any ground um, as it stands. I really just don't see. I don't see it. Um, I should also point out that the. Uh, the Yugoslavian unit over here, I believe, can attack. Um, I just don't see where it makes sense to because of the terrain, uh, honestly. So while they're surrounded by Axis units, there's not much they can do. They're going to get help because when Italy surrenders, the Yugoslavian armies 
pop in, and then it becomes its own little tangle fight down here, but um, they can't really do anything right now. That's, that's sort of the reality. Um, the only difference I could find would be, you know, if they have some kind of bonus for being uh, a mountain unit, but I'm, I, I don't think it's going to matter very much. So, okay, um, so for the West OKW, I don't think there's much that the Axis can do. Um, I really don't see a point. I could maybe see, uh, you know, you could just say, oh, we're going to move, um, we're going to move one unit into Marseille just so that we're protecting the city of Marseille. I'll do, you know, that's off camera from what you guys can see right now. I'm just going to do that and have that be the movement. But for the OKW or OKH, which is going to be, you know, our one opportunity to respond in the Eastern Front, we need to think through it. So I'm going to I'm going to think on that, and then I'll show you what we end up with from there. Okay, so the Axis reaction move was very simple. Um, we basically just moved uh, one unit um, to here, and there's no use attacking with them. But the the whole purpose was to ensure that there is some inner, you know, overlapping or, or closed, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, Zox that are mechanized. So mechanized Zox here, here, mechanized Zox here, here, just so that we don't open, you know, there's not a really easy lane for these guys to, to slip past without causing their own uh, supply problems. So I that knowing we only have the one marker, that was the best I could do, I think, uh, as the Axis. And, it, and you really don't have much that you can do. Um, okay, so now we have the Allied Attrition segment. Um, I do not believe there are any units that are out of supply. Um, I need to double check, I guess, one little thing in terms of tracing the supply path. Okay, enemy socks are negated by a friendly unit for supply tracing. So, um, yeah, I, we are we are good from a supply standpoint for everyone, bad or good, in this case. Um, so attrition phase is over, and now we go to the uh, Allied exploitation phase. Um, well, the Western Allies don't have anywhere to go. Uh, there are mechanized zonks, so there's not much they can really do there. Um, yeah, so there, there is not going to be any Western ally exploitation movement. They don't really have anywhere to go. The uh, the Soviets can potentially, but only if they're in range of a Stavka marker, which isn't going to be everyone. Um, there's a armored Zok here, so these guys can't slip past. Um, one, two, three, four. Uh, these guys aren't going to be able to do a whole lot. Um, I guess what they could do is send them, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we at least have the moved around. Um, <laughs> The rest of these guys are out of range of Stavka. Um, one, two, three, four. This guy's in range of Stavka, so we could do something like that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, just out of range, so we could kind of move through a rel and move that way. And I guess this guy could move like that. I think that I think that works. I think that works to our advantage. So we're kind of we took a rail, we're beyond a rail now, we're pressing back this way. And then uh, there's armored zocks here so we can't really do anything. Um, 
and these guys aren't mechanized, so they can't really do anything, and everything else is stuck where it is. So, okay, uh, exploitation movement wasn't great. There's not many places we can go, um, but we are at least pressing. Uh, we are pressing the um, the axis fairly well. I mean, you know, this is just the first turn, so. We're, we're breaking the axis back. You know, if I think back to my experience playing the Dark Valley, right, this is kind of where, it, where we're going. We need to hit the Germans. Uh, we need to crack them, crack them so hard that they can't cover everywhere, and then we just start to overwhelm them. So I, I think we did pretty good. If, if we look at the dead pile, um, which is really, you know, just from these combats, the Soviets have lost six... Infantry steps, well, I think all of their units are single step units, and then one mechanized, so seven steps lost, right? But the axes have lost a whole lot more than that. Um, so if I try to count it all out, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 11 armored steps, some of which may have been, some of these might have been reduced at game start, so I'm not 100% sure of that. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 7 infantry steps, 11 armor steps in total. So definitely the Soviets are putting the hurt on the Germans um, with a pretty decent differential and again that that important one being you know we we're knocking down the armored force um, and really the Soviets are just losing infantry so far. I didn't find anything in the rules that say like when you take losses you have to pick a certain kind over the other so Certainly, you know, the Soviets are going to lose infantry steps rather than mechanized or armor steps when they take losses uh, in a stack just because, um, you know, again, that it, it's just better. It's just better for them to do it that way. Um, so, yeah, so far so good. Um, I do think the limiting multi-hex attacks makes for interesting decisions, right? It'd be kind of easy if you could just say, okay, three hexes attack this hex, overwhelming force, easily removed. Here you kind of have to think a little bit more about the localized nature of the attack that you're launching and what it's going to achieve. So operationally, it, it, it is its own puzzle. It is different than standard hex encounter for that reason. Um, but it's so far, so good. It's, again, my main gripe probably so far is the minor river versus major river, you know, smash my head into a freaking wall problem. Um, but we'll, we'll work it out as we go. Um, okay, so that was the exploitation phase. Now we have the strategic transit phase, which is really the last sort of phase of uh, the turn. So there's Allied Transit Bombing Segment. That only comes into play uh, if we actually had uh, air command set to do transit bombing. We do not, so we're going to do strategic transit. Uh, first is the Axis strategic transit, then we have the Western Allies and the Soviets. Um, so the Axis player may move four units, not steps, by strategic movement within each theater. Axis units may only move between ports on the Baltic or Black Seas. Uh, any unit that moves through more than one theater costs one of the four allowed transit units for each theater moved through. The total number of Axis transit units allowed to move may be lowered by the bombing thing. So we got that. Um, for strategic transit, so this is your, your strat move for this game. Um, uh, we can have allied movements move into, out of, or between uh, the England and Mediterranean boxes. Um, in general, supplied units may move any distance from friendly controlled town cities and ports to any other friendly controlled town city or port. So it's not just any old hex. It actually does have to be sort of an infrastructure point. Um, uh, we have to make sure they're always in supply, uh, that stacking limits are obeyed, and the unit may start or end in an enemy Zoc only if the Hex already has a friendly unit there. Um, okay, gotcha. Okay, so 
four units within each theater. So four, I think we're, we're going to focus on the Mediterranean theater for a second, because we do need to set some stuff up. Um, so, uh, I think first things first, we're going to want to move this guy from Ragusa, uh, which is not in danger of being invaded or whatever, and we're going to have one of our transit spots used to move him to Messina. Um, and then, likewise, we're going to do that for Valona. So that gives us coverage down here. Um, and then we're going to have two units. Well, hmm. Have two units move to uh, right. We're going to have one go to Casino, one of the fort spaces, and one's going to come down to Rome. So technically we've used four movement in the Mediterranean theater, so we're done. We did technically use two from Yugoslavia for the Balkan front, so uh, we don't have many options there. I don't think there's any more that I want to make other than um, oof. maybe we move this one to Salonika. I think that's the only other one that makes sense. Um, in the Northwest Theater, I'm really not sure there's any that I really want to make, to be honest. Um, I do think we are going to use uh, some in the Eastern Theater, and uh, I think what we want to end up trying to do is put the unit that was in Moss or in Berlin into um, ooh, this is tough. Uh, Oh man, I don't know. This is tough. I definitely want to get a unit over there. Um, maybe we put something in Stalino, just just to kind of help protect that guy. Um, I mean, it's a Mountaineer unit. I'm not sure how much value that adds, but I want to get some more units in this space. Maybe we put them in Dnipro Petrovs, just so there's something defending there in the case that the Soviets sneak out. And that's it, I guess. Um, now we have the Allied strategic, um, so we can move for the Allies. Um, oh man, my camera's going to run out of battery. Stand by. Okay, we're going to talk while my camera is on the charger, not quite able to drag it too far away from the outlet, because the charging cable is not very long. Okay, so uh, the rest of the transit movement, gosh, um, not a whole lot we can actually do. So let me talk through it. So uh, the Soviets can do uh, six units, but as is right now, there's just not enough units on towns or cities that aren't already kind of where they need to be for this to very much help us. So Soviets really aren't going to do any transit movement, strategic movement. Um, this is really more important for the Germans right now as they're trying to get some defenders, some additional defenders into... Uh, you know, Italy to, to do more stuff, right? It's sort of the whole purpose and point of what they're doing down there. And even then, they couldn't do a whole lot. Um, but the main thing is, help defend Sicily. Um, we probably need to get some more guys, I think, just in general, uh, into some places, because I could see some places on the map right now that are not well defended that probably need to get some units somewhere. In fact, I am going to make a change to... Ugh. None of these, like, I can't cover every landing site. That's really the main problem we have. We can't cover every landing site. So, wherever we can go, we're certainly trying to make something happen. Anyway, um, okay, so, uh, the Allies can do strategic movement between the England boxes and ports and the whole thing. Right now, here's the problem, the, the problem that we faced before. 
The only beachhead we have open in Sicily is for the Americans, and the Americans only. The beachhead marker can only be occupied by U.S. troops, not by Commonwealth troops. We don't have any more U.S. troops in the Mediterranean box, um, so we can't move any reinforcements into Gala or near Gala or whatever, um, or to the to the uh, beachhead marker box, or the beachhead box, whatever hex you want to call it. And the Commonwealth can't help get there either. They're not allowed to be there. Um, so that's a conundrum. We can't do anything more to help. Now, uh, by the standard rule, you can transit units from the Mediterranean box to the England box, right? That sort of represent like a drawdown from Italy, move units to England to help with D-Day. Um, but the rules by default don't allow the opposite. You're not allowed to strat, move, transit, move units from the England box to the Mediterranean box. But now is a great time to talk about the optional rules in the game, where we could potentially do that. Um, so here's the, here are the optional rules. There's an optional rule on uh, flexible allied deployment. So that would be this section right here. If gamers believe the limitation on allied deployment of troops from the England box to the Med box is too restrictive, uh, you can instead say, may be shifted from the England box to the Med box uh, per those rules, but the beachhead markers and the mulberry marker may not be moved. So, I hadn't decided if I was playing with any optional rules, and here is where it would kind of matter. So we could try to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to move a unit, I'm going to move an American unit from the England box to the Mediterranean box, because we need to get more guys in the system. I'm not sure that I'm going to do that, um, just because uh, I, I think with the way the transit rules are set up here, that um, da 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 da. Okay, I think the limitation is, even if I did that, if I moved one or two or, th or the three American units from England to the Med, they could only go from that box to that box. They could not get into Gala or the Beachhead Marker or anything in this single segment. I, th I think each unit can only make sort of one move per action here. I don't think I'm allowed to get them all the way into the beachhead marker in one transit move. So I don't think the Western Allies are going to do any transit movement. Um, and the Soviets don't do any either. So really, this is just the Axis trying to figure out how do they defend Italy, which is very hard to do, I think, no matter which way you cut it. Um, so that would be it for the strategic transit phase. Then we have a victory point phase. Um, so right now, the victory point situation is the Allies, or the, you know, the... the non-Axis powers have one victory point, and that was the Soviets taking Kharkov. So the Soviets are providing one victory point um, that is in Kharkov. Uh, the Western Allies have yet to gain a victory point. Um, and then uh, we have the cleanup phase, which in this case is just going to involve uh, moving, removing the shafe markers, I guess, the command markers and the shafe markers. Um, or I guess maybe not the shape markers. I think it's just the Soviet uh, Stavka markers that are removed. I'll double check that. But that's it for turn one, guys. Like that, that would be it. Um, as I look at the other optional rules, you know, there's stuff here for weather. Um, I think I'll look to play with the weather rules. We'll see. Um, and weather has an impact on uh, the German and Soviet command markers. It also may affect when and how invasions can occur. Um, and then there's some other uh, optional rules for the Panzer divisions being turned into core and some fog of war stuff that isn't relevant for a solitaire game. So not much in the way of optional rules, but I could see why, in my case, you might say, well, I'd like to be able to move units from England to the Med Mediterranean to help. Um, I think that's an easy one just to say, oh, that optional rule is in play. In my case, it wouldn't help anything, even if I was playing with it, um, but maybe in the future it would be. Me not getting an open Commonwealth port sucks for the Allies right now. That's really the pain that they're suffering at the moment. Um, 
So, uh, thoughts so far, um, before we close up the video, because I'm running out of time here, I want to finish up this video and get it up before we get into turn two. Um, I, I think in terms of the victory point situation, uh, there's definitely a challenge in like, okay, do we even go into the Balkans? Well, there is Athens' victory point, and once these Italians are gone, it'll be more lightly defended. I think the Allies want to probably get Athens. The other victory points uh, in the Balkans are basically Belgrade. And that's it. So I'm not terribly sure what the draw... And clear that up. My camera's goofing up. So yeah, I think the Allies maybe try to invade Athens at some point. Um, other areas not as important. The Balkans seems like it's not as valuable to try when you really need to be getting these other victory point hexes. Uh, there's Rome. There's not even any in southern Italy at all. But you kind of need to get the basing down here to get Rome, Marseille, Milan, Trieste, uh, Munich, Strasbourg, Paris. Um, and there's obviously a lot of victory hexes sort of in uh, the USSR still to get. So definitely a timer on the Allies. They need to be picking up victory points to be able to win the game. Um, certainly going to try to do that. My, any other thoughts I have on the game right now are the map terrain annoys me, the terrain hexes in general, and then the major versus minor river is going to drive me nuts trying to figure it out. Otherwise, I think the game is playing pretty good. Uh, the, the mechanics uh, seem pretty pretty good. Um, it makes sense, uh, even if people I've seen people complain about like the supply system and the command system and. There's no railroad, so you know there, if there was a railroad here, that would actually suffice to do X, Y, Z. I, I think that's just a, a level of abstraction I'm okay with here. So so far so good. Um, just man, this map art is gonna kill me. But besides that, the game is playing fine, and, it, and so far interesting puzzles to figure out. So okay, guys, that's the end of turn one. I'll see you in the next video for turn two when I'm able to get to that. Um, have a good day. Have a good gaming day. Whatever you're doing, I hope you're gaming. Um, yeah, until then, take care, guys. Keep gaming. See ya.